Alrighty, so it is time for chapter four. The small gate was the farthest and least ornate of the entrances to the castle's outer ward. Presumably, it was called the small gate because it was intended for the small folk. It was generally used by servants and couriers as well as apprentices on errands. The gate itself was actually fairly large, in Caelan's opinion. Most of the nobility ignored it, if they even knew it existed. The fact that Meg wanted to meet here made him all the more curious about what her secret could be. As he neared the gate, Caelan scanned the crowd for the princess. She didn't seem to have arrived yet, so he walked over to lean against a section of the outer wall. It gave him a good view of the main road from the castle proper, so, he had, so he'd be sure to see her when she approached. In the meantime, he amused himself by watching other people. While it was true he hadn't gotten to know anyone closely, there were plenty of people he knew by sight, some well enough to pass a few words with now and then. Some folk were always happy to share news and spread gossip, and Caelan liked to hear tales of the world outside his own dreary existence. So far, the only familiar face he saw was Lammy, the kitchen boy. Lammy was about seven, and not the most reliable source of information, especially since he liked to make things up. He was hauling a huge sack of what appeared to be turnips, and not being all that careful with his burden either. As Caelan watched, two of the pale vegetables tumbled out onto the ground, and the sack showed definite signs of having been dragged through the dirt for at least part of its journey. Caleb shook his head and jogged over to rescue the fallen turnips. Need some help with that, Lammy? he asked, handing the turnips over to the boy. No, Lammy said testily, grabbing them and stuffing them back into the sack. I got it. I could carry this a hundred miles if I wanted to. A thousand, probably. He paused, considering, unless you want to make it fly for me? He looked up at Caelan, hopefully. Not because I can't carry it, because I can, but i never seen flying turnips before, and so that would be good. Also, Cook would probably shout when she saw them and drop her spoon. He seemed to find this last idea especially appealing. Kaylin smiled down at him. Sorry, Lammy. Maid Sarah hasn't taught me anything about levitation yet. At Lammy's blank stare, he clarified, that means making things fly. I could turn them into toads for you, though, if you wanted. Then they could hop to the kitchen on their own. He lifted a hand theatrically, pointed at the turnips and raised his eyebrows at the boy. Lammy scowled and thrust the sack higher up against his shoulder. That's dumb. What's Cook going to do with toads? Can't make turnip soup from toads. He started walking again, muttering about toads as he went. Caelan laughed and headed back toward the wall. He couldn't really have turned them into toads, of course. Sarek still denied that such transformations were even possible, although Caelan was pretty sure Sarek just didn't want to teach him about it. He frowned, probably didn't think he had the discipline or intelligence to handle it. Well, that didn't matter anymore. Kalen had decided to take more of his education into his own hands. You could learn a great deal from a book, he'd discovered. The pages he'd read in the Irulum, Irulum had been far more informative than anything Sarek had deigned to tell him, although he still hadn't found any clear instructions about interpreting the spirit card reading he'd done yesterday. There were apparently hundreds of different ways to deal and read the cards, and Caelan hadn't seen anything that seemed to relate to the specific pattern Sarek had laid out. Also, Mage Erlen assumed a certain level of knowledge and experience in his readers, and so didn't explain a lot of things in detail that Caelan guessed most full mages would already know. But that didn't matter either. either. With time and lots more reading, he'd eventually be able to understand, and he wouldn't need Sarek's help to do it. Kayla looked around with growing impatience. Where was May? It was all very well for her to tell him not to treat her like the princess she was, but she couldn't at the same time expect him to wait around all day so she could show up at her leisure. Unless, his heart went small and tight within his chest, had she only been having fun with him yesterday? She was a princess, after all. She certainly didn't need to befriend some lowly apprentice in order to have someone to share secrets with. Suddenly, he felt very stupid. Of course, that had to be it. She had probably laughed about it all morning, or all evening, with her sisters mocking the silly, lonely boy who actually thought a princess wanted to be his friend. He pushed away from the wall, his face hot with embarrassment, but couldn't help looking around once more. As he turned back toward the castle, he noticed a scruffy-looking girl eyeing him with an amused smile. Kaylin glared back at her. What did she think was so funny? Oh. Oh. He walked over to her, struggling not to grin like an idiot. How long have you been here? Just a short while, Meg said. I was wondering how long it would take you to recognize me. I almost didn't. You look really different. She was wearing a tunic and faded breeches, similar to the clothing of most boys and many girls whose responsibilities had them running long errands or working outside the castle. Hers were certainly dirty enough to look authentic, 
Perhaps she had borrowed them from a real errand girl. Her boots were splattered with dried mud, and her hair was loose over her shoulders and looked rather tangled. It was hard to believe this was the same girl he had seen yesterday. Well, good. It certainly wouldn't be much of a disguise if I looked the same, would it? Now, come on. She started briskly for the gate, and he hurried to catch up. Why do you need a disguise? She gave him a disgusted look. You seemed smarter than this yesterday. For one thing, princesses do not go wandering outside the castle grounds by themselves. My parents would never permit it, and the guards know it. Marl tries it often enough, so they're always on the lookout for her, but they believe we older girls have more sense. She flashed him a wry smile, and he had to smile back. Even after his doubts a few minutes before, her comment about his intelligence lacked the same bite as Sarek's more pointed remark. And besides, he hadn't been stupid. She was here, just like she said he'd be. she'd be. They were almost at the gate. Meg shook her head, causing some of her hair to fall around her face. Her hands were thrust into her pockets, and she walked with a slumped posture that was completely unlike the normal way she carried herself. The transformation was amazing. No one would ever imagine she was really a princess. Kalin forced himself to stop staring, lest he draw unwanted attention to her, and looked up at the nearest guard instead. The guard was one he recognized. Larid, he thought his name was. And Kalin waved as he walked past. Larid nodded back, nodded back at him, and then turned his eyes to the next in line. Meg walked through beside him without incident. For another thing, she went on, once they were safely past the gate, this is a secret, remember? Even if I were allowed outside as myself, people might wonder where I was going and why, and arousing curiosity about something is generally not the best way to keep it secret. Melly, the dirty errand girl, however, can go virtually anywhere without attracting anyone's attention. Melly? She shrugged and pushed her hair back behind her ears. I had to have a name ready just in case anyone asked. Yes, but Melly? You be quiet or I'll make up a name for you too. Kalen held up his hands. All right, you win. No more teasing about the name. So where are we headed, Melly? Are you going to tell me the secret or not? She looked back over her shoulders, or over her shoulder toward the gate. Once we're out of view of the guards, we're going to leave the road and head for those trees at the bottom of the hill. And then, and then you'll find out what the secret is. Can't you tell me now? She shook her head, smiling. Sorry, you'll just have to learn to be patient, I'm afraid. The road from the gate took a sharp turn toward the south, heading to where it would eventually branch into two roads, one going on to meet up with the Queen's Road and one continuing toward the market grounds. Once they passed the turn, Meg took a final glance around, then pulling, pulled Kaylin off into the, onto the grassy field beside the road. Walk casually, she said, as if we were just wandering over to the trees to rest in the shade. They stepped slowly through the field, teeny flowers, pea blossoms, grew among the tall grass, sprinkling the green with bright flecks of pink and yellow and violet. Kalin stretched his arms up and closed his eyes for a moment to focus on the feel of the warm breeze against his face. It was nice to be out in the sun. One of the worst parts of being a mage, he often thought, must be having to spend so much time cooped up in a dark study. As an apprentice, at least he got to travel to the market once a week and run occasional errands outside the castle. But most of the business of magic itself seemed to require darkness and dust and shadows. He couldn't even remember the last time he'd seen Sarek outside in the daytime. No wonder the man was always in such a foul mood. Suddenly, Kalin pitched forward. He managed to get his feet back under him just in time to avoid falling on his face and twisted around to look for whatever had stripped him. After a second, he saw it. Stupid rock. Meg was smirking at him again. You might want to try walking with your eyes open, she suggested innocently. Sometimes that can help. Kaylin just looked at her until she turned away, laughing. He shook his head. She certainly did seem to find him amusing, but somehow it didn't bother him so much today. They had come to the outer line of trees. The grassy field gave way to forest floor. Kaylin tried to keep an eye on his feet, not wanting to give any rocks or bulging, excuse me, or bulging tree roots a chance to trip him. Meg seemed a lot quieter than she'd been yesterday. Maybe she was thinking about her secret. He hoped that it, that was it and not that she was getting bored with him already. How was the big dinner last night, he asked her. Hmm? Oh, it was wonderful, she said. Prince Ryan seems almost as perfect as Marley's made him out to be, and I think everyone had a good time. Did you talk to anyone interesting, like that guard with the scar? Jorn? No, I didn't get to talk to him, but I sat next to one of the other guards, Richton. I think you'd like him. He told great stories. He had all of us caught up in tales most of the evening, and I met the son of King Ryland's chief advisor. His name is Willem. She stopped and looked as if she were deciding what to say next. Then she suddenly looked startled and grabbed his arm. Oh, and I can't believe I almost forgot. I also sat next to Sarah. What? He was there? 
She nodded. He sat next to me after having a mysterious private word with my parents, which unfortunately I wasn't close enough to overhear. I didn't even realize he'd be at the feast until I saw him come in. Me neither, Kaylin said. I mean, I knew he went off to talk to your parents, but not that he'd be staying for the dinner. Do you know why he wanted to talk to them? They didn't say a word to us about it. Yes, Kaylin began, then stopped, feeling, suddenly feeling like an idiot again. He'd been so preoccupied with his anger at Sarek's dismissal of his abilities that somehow he hadn't given further thought to what his reading of the cards had already suggested. Even with Sarek's refusal to explain anything to him, it was obvious that bad things were involved, bad things that were going to be happening to Trillian. And of course, Meg would want to know that. He should have thought to tell her right away, except he didn't know what to tell her exactly. That terrible yet vague dangers were on the way. Look out. Something in his face must have reflected his thoughts. Meg stopped walking, her eyes wide and concerned. Well, what? What is it, Caleb? He shook his head. I don't really know. She poked her fing a finger at him angrily. Don't do that, she said. You do know, too know, and you are going to tell me. She poked him again harder. Right now. Caleb rubbed his chest. Did she always have to be so violent? No, you don't understand. I want to tell you. It's just that it's... It's, it's complicated. Meg folded her arms across her chest and stood there, staring at him. He sighed. Then he explained about the cards and the reading and how Sarek refused to tell him anything more about it. So even I can, so even I can see it's about some, excuse me. So, so even I can see it's about something bad, he said finally, but I just don't know what. He thought back to the card with a grinning skull and shuddered. They started walking again. Well, I can't pretend I'm not concerned, Meg said after a minute, but I think it's too soon to get upset over this. For one thing, you don't know for certain what the cards meant. She looked up at him apologetically. I mean, you are just starting with divination. You said it yourself. He shrugged. Well, yeah, that's true. For another, it sounds like some of the bad images you saw were balanced out by more positive ones. So maybe the overall meaning isn't necessarily a dire one. That's possible, isn't it? Kaylin looked over at her, impressed. For someone who didn't know anything about magic, she was doing some pretty clear thinking on the subject. Yeah, he said again. I guess that could be true also. Don't mistake me. I fully intend to find out what's going on. I'm just saying we shouldn't automatically assume the worst. The world is a big, wide place with all kinds of wonderful things in it, one of which I should point out you are about to see. Suddenly, they were standing before the entrance to a cave. It looked extraordinarily dark and mysterious in there, just the sort of place that cried out to be explored by a brave adventurer. Kalen found himself impressed again. He wouldn't have thought a princess would be the sort of girl who went crawling into dark caves in the woods. Of course, he wasn't usually the sort of boy who went crawling into dark caves in the woods himself, but Meg didn't need to know that. In here, he asked, ducking his head to step inside. Kalen, wait! She grabbed his arm and pulled him back from the entrance. His surprise at being suddenly yanked backward, combined with his seemingly infallible ability to find rocks with his feet, conspired to spill him gracelessly onto the hard ground. He raised his head to stare at Meg, who blushed. Sorry. She reached out a hand to help him up. But I need to go in first. I've never brought anyone here before, and it might be dangerous for you to go in without me. Kaylin raised his eyebrows at this. Don't take it personally, she said. Trust me. You'll understand in a minute. With that, she turned back toward the entrance. But then she stopped again, one hand touching the rough stone wall, the other motionless at her side. Meg, what's wrong? It took her a moment to turn back around. Her face had changed. Suddenly she seemed lost and unsure, not at all the brash and confident girl she'd been just a few seconds earlier. Meg, she stood there looking at him, thinking God's knew what. Then she shook her head. Nothing. Nothing's wrong. She hesitated, then went on. It's just strange. I can't tell my parents, my sisters, not even Marley. But I do think I can tell you. I know we only met yesterday, and it's crazy that I'm so sure I can trust you, but she shrugged. I do. Meg turned back to the cave entrance. Caleb didn't say anything. He didn't want to accidentally say the wrong thing and make her hesitate again. Before she went in, though, she spun back around to face him one more time. He blinked. Her face and her pointy finger were inches away from his nose. Of course, if you prove me wrong, I'll have to hurt you. Just, you know, keep that in mind. Then she grinned and tucked and ducked inside. Kaylin swallowed nervously, then went in after her. The cave wound back into a tunnel. In an awkward crouch, he stepped forward carefully, keeping one hand against the cave wall for balance. Up ahead, he could just make out Meg's shape in the dwindling light from the entrance. She turned back to whisper softly, careful, it bends to the right here. Then she disappeared. 
Advancing slowly, Kalen followed the tunnel around the sharp turn. The light from the entrance was cut off completely now, and he couldn't see it all. Kalen didn't normally consider himself the timid sort, well, except maybe where heights were concerned. But that was only common sense. But this is like was like being blind. He stepped forward again and again, one hand stretched out before him, certain each time that his foot would encounter nothing but empty space, and he'd go plunging to his death. How had Meg ever found this place? He was fairly certain he wouldn't have had the courage to venture in this far alone. Suddenly there was a sound from the darkness ahead, making him jump. Meg, he called out. Surely that sound had just been her. No reason to assume it was anything evil and scary. If some horrible cave creature were, was, was lurking in here, Meg would probably have already encountered it. She'd clearly been here before, but then again, she had been concerned about his safety when they entered. So maybe there was something to be afraid of after all. These were not helpful thoughts. Meg, he called again. His voice sounded very small. Probably just some effect of the cave ceiling, he told himself reassuringly. Here, Caelan. He felt her hand brush his fingertips, and he took hold of it carefully, gratefully. She pulled him forward around another bend to where a slight glow began to illuminate the tunnel walls. He could make out her face now in the darkness. Her eyes were shining with excitement. Ready? Kayla nodded, though at the moment he wasn't sure he was ready. What kind of crazy secret was this, anyway? She could have warned him about the dark tunnel, at least. His heart was still beating a bit too fast as she led him around another corner into a softly glowing chamber. There he is, Meg whispered, squeezing his hand. Kalen felt his jaw drop. He froze in the entrance, staring. It was a dragon. Curled up against the rock wall, it lay as if sleeping, with its pointed tail resting over its forelegs. As the first moment of shocked recognition passed, a dragon. It's a dragon, Kalen realized that it was probably still very young. From the little he knew about them, full-grown dragons were supposed to be enormous, and this one seemed barely bigger than some of the king's war horses. Its scales were a dark, rich green, deepening to nearly black at tail and wingtips, and its slender head was crowned with sharp spikes that continued partway down its long neck. He supposed it was beautiful in a frightening, serpentine way, but most of all, in that small, confined space, it was terrifying, and Kalen couldn't imagine how they'd be able to make it back out the tunnel entrance before it caught them and killed them, or simply burned them to a crisp from where it lay, assuming it was old enough to make fire. Before he could even begin to think of what to say, Meg released his hand and began walking toward the creature. It opened great yellow eyes and calmly watched her approach. Kaylin stared in horror, certain he was about to see her torn apart with claws and teeth before his eyes. Instead, the dragon rolled over onto its back and let her scratch its scaly belly. Kaylin was aware of his jaw falling even further toward the ground and quickly closed his mouth before Meg could notice and make fun of him. She looked over at him and smiled. Come on, she said. I think it's all right. You think it's all right? He asked under his breath. All the same, he found himself walking toward them. He still couldn't quite believe it. He had certainly never expected to see a dragon close up in his lifetime. They tended to avoid populated areas, and as a mage in service, he would most likely always live in or near large towns or cities. Yet here he was, not only looking at a dragon, but apparently about to touch it, assuming it didn't decide to kill him before he got the chance. The dragon, meanwhile, had returned to its previous position. It watched him with those unblinking yellow eyes. Meg stroked it and whispered to it softly. When he was only a few steps away, Meg stopped him. Now, slowly hold out your hands, she said, and wait. Kalen did so. For a moment, nothing happened. He and the dragon looked silently at each other. Was he supposed to look at its eyes? Or would that see be seen as some kind of challenge? He hoped it was all right, because he couldn't seem to look away. The dragon was mesmerizing, as still as if it were carved in stone, except that it was clearly very, very much alive. Slowly it started to move. It uncurled itself and slid toward him, sharp claws scraping against the rock floor. Kalen remained frozen as the thing circled him, twining snake-like around his legs and inhaling with great snorts of breath. It was amazingly supple. It twisted bonelessly to surround him with its long body as it finally brought its head up to face his own. The yellow eyes stared into his with a strange alien intelligence for several slow seconds. Kalen could just see Meg back against the wall, watching silently. Then the dragon began moving again, twisting around and bringing its scaly neck up to rub against the undersides of his outstretched hands. Kalen released the breath he had been holding and thought he heard Meg do the same. 
He ran his hands along the creature's neck, feeling the smooth scales move under his skin. It was amazing. He was stroking a dragon. He'd bet Mage Sarek had never done anything like this. Finally, the dragon slid back over to where Meg was now sitting. It curled up around her and appeared to go back to sleep. Kaelin shook his head in wonder and went to sit beside her. His name is Jekyll, she said, or at least that's what I've been calling him. How? Kaelin didn't even know how to finish the question. His mind was still reeling. A dragon? Meg rested a hand on Jekyll's neck and looked down at him fondly. I found him about five months ago. I have no idea where he came from. Crawled down from the mountains, I imagine. But he was so little, and there was no sign of his mother or any other dragons. Nan Vera had taken all of us out for a walk in the woods, and as usual, we had all wandered off in different directions. She paused to glance up at Kaelin, grinning. She really hates when we do that. I was walking near a creek, not really thinking about where I was going, and suddenly I heard this terrible hissing. I looked up, and there he was, perched perched on the edge of a rock near the water. He was tiny then, about the size of a big dog, but still, with his wings spread and his mouth open like that, it was terrifying. I didn't know then that he didn't have any fire yet either. What did you do? Well, at first I didn't do anything. I was too scared. That was probably a good thing, I think. If I had tried to run away run right then or cry out. I'm not sure what he would have done. So I just stood there frozen and I tried to radiate goodwill. That must sound pretty stupid, but it's all I could think of. They're supposed to be able to sense things. At least I thought I remembered that from stories. And so I thought, let him just sense that I'm not going to hurt him. No, that's not stupid at all, Kayla said. I mean, I don't really know about dragons, but Sarek has taught me about dealing with aggressive creatures in the wild. And you're supposed to try to communicate physically. Let them know you're not a threat. You probably did exactly the right thing. She shrugged. Well, it seemed to work. <clears throat> After a few minutes, he came over, sort of like you did, or he did to you just now. Stared at me like he was trying to see who I was. Then he relaxed and rubbed his head against my leg, just like, uh, just like a cat. I swear, I expected him to start purring. Anyway, just then I heard Nan Vera calling for us, and I knew I couldn't let her see him. She'd tell my parents that I didn't know what they would do. I'm sure they wouldn't just leave a dragon to grow up with inside of the castle, though. So I told, them, told him to wait, that I'd be back. I know he couldn't really understand me, but he didn't follow when I backed away, so either he somehow picked up some of my meaning, or he was just too cautious to go toward the other voices. After that, I started sneaking out every couple of days to visit him, and eventually I found the cave and brought him here. She cocked her head, frowning. He's growing so fast, though. Pretty soon, he'll get too big for the tunnel. I don't know what I'll do with him then. Aren't you worried at all about what will happen when he's fully grown? I mean, about him attacking the castle or carrying off serving girls or something? Meg shook her head. No, I know I should be, but I'm not. I feel connected to him somehow. Maybe it's all the time we've spent together or that he was separated from his mother so young, but somehow I know he's not going to hurt me. And I don't mean just physically. I mean, I know he's not going to threaten the castle or do anything that would cause me pain. She tapped her heart, then looked at Kaelin, clearly wanting him to understand. I know it in here. I can feel it. Is that crazy? Kaelin looked down at the dragon, sleeping with his head snuggled tight against Meg's body. What she was saying did sound a little crazy, really. And yet, there was clearly something going on here. He looked back at her. Her eyes were still on him, more open than he'd seen them before, questioning, wanting his approval? Understanding? I don't know, Meg, he said slowly. It seems possible, but at the same time, it's a big risk to place that much trust in a feeling. But it's more than a feeling. I, I can't really explain, she paused, seeming to steal herself before she went on. When she spoke again, it was in a rush, as though she didn't want to give herself time to think. We're connected, Kaylin. I mean, truly connected. I can feel him all the time. He, he pulls at me, as if he wants something, but I don't know what it is. It's like there's a part of him that lives inside me now. It gets stronger when I get closer, but even when I'm farther away, he's with me. I can't make it go away. And sometimes, she looked down at her hands, which she was wringing nervously, sometimes I don't want it to go away. It makes me feel strong, powerful, like I can do anything. But even when it feels good, it's scary. I'm different. I'm changing. I, I don't know what to do. She fell silent. Kaylin tried to think of what to say. The bold, brash princess was gone again. During those last few sentences, Meg had sounded frightened and alone. She's asking for my help, he realized. Maybe that shouldn't have been so startling, but it was.
Had anyone ever asked for his help before? Ever? He didn't think so. There had never been anyone to ask him. People had always been telling him to do things. The innkeeper and his wife, cooks and masters of hearths and stables, made Sarek in abundance, but no one ever asked Kind of repeat just a little bit. She fell silent. Kaylin tried to think of what to say. The bold, brash princess was gone again. During those last few sentences, Meg had sounded frightened and alone. She's asking for my help, he realized. Maybe that shouldn't have been so startling, but it was. Had anyone ever asked for his help before? Ever? He didn't think so. There had never been anyone to ask. People had always been telling him to do things. The innkeeper and his wife, cooks and masters of hearths and stables, made Sarek in abundance but no one ever asked him for anything. He felt something small and bright and warm flare into existence deep inside him, the same sort of feeling that magic used to inspire in him before it became clear that Sarek had been wrong about him, that he didn't have whatever natural ability the mage had thought he'd sensed all those years ago that day at the inn. His spark, he thought. Sarek had used that word, and Kalin had assumed he meant it metaphorically, but that's really what it was. He could feel it. He hadn't realized how much he'd missed it until he suddenly had it back again. Kaylin, please, Meg whispered into the silence. Say something. You're the only person who knows. I can't tell anyone else. If my family knew, they'd take him away. I couldn't stand that. She looked up at him, hopeful and scared. Kaylin watched her watching him, both of them trying to read the other. I'll help you, Meg, he said. She smiled, and Kaylin thought he had never seen a sweeter sight. Of course, I'll help you. I don't know anything about dragons, really, but I'll learn. Mage Fredrin's old library, her worry returned in an instant. But you can't ask Sarek. If he found out about Jackal, Kaylin smiled grimly. I won't ask him. I know how to find some things out on my own. If Meg heard any of the bitterness in his words, she gave no sign. You really think there might be something in Fredrin's books? Have you ever seen that library? I'm pretty sure everything is in one of Fredrin's books somewhere. It's just a question of figuring out where to look. That would be the hard part. He would st he could start with the Erlen. There must be something about dragons in there, and maybe that would lead to other references. Meg placed a hand on his arm. Thank you, Kaylin. He smiled back at her, a real smile this time. She's my friend, he thought suddenly. I have a friend. Why would Sarek try so hard to avoid this? They stayed for the good part of the afternoon, talking about everything and nothing in the way that Kaylin supposed friends did. Meg asked him questions about his life before Sarek, and seemed shocked to learn that he didn't have any family of his own. When she told him stories about her sisters and parents and that Nan Vera, a person who always seemed to be around, Kaylin tried to imagine what it must be like to be part of such a large and complex arrangement of people. Sometimes it just sounded exhausting, but he thought that at other times it must be kind of nice. Jekyll nudged at Meg for attention periodically, but otherwise seemed content just to have her nearby. Kaylin kept stealing glances at the dragon, still trying to accept what he was seeing. A dragon by the gods. If someone had told him yesterday that today he would be sitting in a secret cave with a princess and a dragon, he never would have believed it. And here it was, really happening. Eventually, they got up to leave, saying goodbye to Jekyll, Meg with another belly rub, Caleb with a more reserved pat on the neck. Those yellow eyes still made him more than a little nervous. As they made their way back through the tunnel, Caleb spoke into the, black, the quiet blackness, Thank you for bringing me here, Meg, he said. I'm honored that you shared your secret with me. He couldn't see her face, but somehow he knew she was smiling again. You're welcome, she said softly, and thank you too.